Welcome to Off Duty, I'm Kelsey Hubbard. Christian Borel is the star of the television show Smash, and he was recently nominated for a Tony for his turn in the Broadway show Peter and the Star Catcher. The actor sat down with Barbara Chai from the Wall Street Journal's Speakeasy to talk about the Smash finale playing on Broadway every night and what's ahead for him. The show is going on and it is going on tonight. Hi, I'm Barbara Chai with the Wall Street Journal, and we're joined today by Christian Borrell, star of Smash and Peter and the Star Catcher. Thanks for joining us today, Christian. How I'm are you? thrilled to be here. I'm good. <laughs> it's a gorgeous day. So Monday is the finale of Smash. Can you believe it? The, the season's coming to a close. I kind of can't believe it. It's all been a whirlwind. There was so much lead up to the kind of premiere, and to think that it's 15 weeks later, it's kind of surreal and very exciting. I can't wait to see what's going to happen. Well, I was just going to ask, what can we expect from the finale? Can you tell us any tidbits? I think the one thing that I know for sure is that it's about musicals <laughs> and the making of one. Uh, I think you are going to be left with a cliffhanger or two, and of course I can't really say much. Um, who's going to get cast as Marilyn, uh, what's going to happen with my relationship with Julia. Um, I'm in character right now, so I call her Julia. In real life, <laughs> she's Deborah Messing, of course. Places, please. Places. Break a leg. You're going to be wonderful. Break a leg. So are there any plans over the summer to turn Smash into a tour the way they did with Glee or to turn Bombshell into a real Broadway musical? I don't <laughs> think the touring idea is, is going to uh, take hold, but I, there, there has been talk and there have been some rumors about whether or not it would be a viable musical for Broadway. And I think when you look at the score, when you look at the original music that Shaman and Whitman have written, I think that's uh, an interesting thing to explore. But everyone that I've talked to, all the powers that be say right now we're just focused focused on the TV show. Yeah, I mean, all the dance numbers are choreographed, all the songs are written. They're amazing. <laughs> I think what it really would need is actually a book and a structure, because one thing that's so exciting about uh, it being a television show, one thing Teresa Rebeck always said was she doesn't know if she could make a great musical about Marilyn Monroe, but she could make a great television show about people trying to make a musical about that's Marilyn great. Monroe. That's yeah. great. So you're a veteran of Broadway, and we're going to get to your current Broadway show, Peter and the Starcatcher, but I just have to ask you, being on a television show about the behind the scenes of a Broadway musical, mm -hmm. how real is it? I mean, when you go out on stage, do people really say, break a leg? Do, pe do actors drop yeah. out at the last second? No, they're, a absolutely. There's a, a lot of the ritualistic aspects of that are, are dead on. And to be honest, when I got the pilot for Smash, I was doing Peter and the Star Catcher downtown, and I actually had to go up to the powers that be and say, I'm so sorry, but I got a pilot. I'm <laughs> going to have to kind of reschedule some things. And the look of, of the look on their face of, of course, congratulations, how wonderful, and now what are we going to do? I think was uh, represented a couple episodes ago when Tony Asbeck, a Broadway actor, wow. came up to me and Derek and said, I got a pilot. So there are some mirrors in there, yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about Peter and the Starcatcher. You, okay. play, you play the Black Stash, a pretty bombastic villain who <laughs> becomes Captain Hook, right? Yes, and indeed. it's a pretty different character from Tom on Smash. <laughs> a pirate with scads of panache wants the key to the trunk with the cash. Now here's some advice, though I seem to be nice, I'll cut you, slit you up one side and down the other so you can watch your own stomach flop around on the deck. I say, Smee, you did explain to my lord that I'm a bloodthirsty outlaw. One of the magical things about the show itself is that I get to play this kind of over-the-top, hammy guy, and then one minute later fold back in and support somebody else's moment. It's the most, the most, the show that most represents the ensemble nature of theater that I've ever been in. Mm -hmm. And you were just no nominated for a Tony Award for I Best was. Featured Actor. And I know that you were also nominated for Legally Blonde. Mm -hmm. um, but is this one, for those reasons you just mentioned, for being part of this ensemble, I know some of your co your um, colleagues sorry, have also been nominated. Yes. So how is this nomination different? Well, it, it's a, the Tony Awards. And it's mm -hmm. just incredibly special. It's a great honor. Um, I was particularly pleased uh, with the attention that the show got in general because while I'm proud of myself and excited for myself because I'm a human being and my mother's very excited about my nomination, uh, the, the work that uh, Alex and Roger did as co-directors and the work that Rick Ellis did writing the play, I certainly wouldn't have been close to a nomination without all the work that they did, that we all did together. It's a really special play, I think, because 
Um, one would think it's written for children. Mm -hmm. When I saw it, I was surrounded by laughing children, but I was utterly delighted. It's obviously also very appealing to adults. It's been critically well received. I mean, what do you think is that appeal? The way that we talk to children, I, I, I meet with more success when, when I talk to children as if they were adults. I don't mm -hmm. think children want to be talked down to. They want to kind of catch up and feel like they are on the level of adults. And I think that's one thing that the play does very, very well. I doubt that a lot of kids are going to get the Proust references. <laughs> I think the Philip Glass joke goes over their head a little bit. Um, so there's something for adults and there's something for kids. And everybody likes a fart joke. <laughs> well, great. Oh, thanks so much for joining us and congratulations on your Tony nomination. We look forward forward to the next season of Smash. <laughs> Thanks so much. So do I, incidentally. <laughs> and let's take a spin with Dan Neal, who took some time with Volvo's C30. He also gets a little misty-eyed thinking about Volvo's now defunct Swedish rival, Saab. Hi, this is Dan Neal with the Wall Street Journal, and I am driving the 2012 Volvo C30 T5 Polestar Edition. It's got uh, 250 horsepower and uh, about 236 pound-feet of torque, a little bit, about 20% better than usual. And it's slammed with all kinds of cool Scandinavian design cues. Now, what I like about this car generally is that uh, it's unapologetically Volvo. It's got a, a sort of a, a, a weird and uh, difficult to manage center console. Uh, it's obviously shaped like a Scandinavian table. You know, it also has uh, a lot of joyous uh, torque steer and, uh, and turbo boost. Uh, car manufacturers have tried to dial out the abruptness of uh, turbo onset, and uh, so they've se used sequential turbos or, you know, mapped it very uh, gradually so that uh, you don't get the big boosty feel. That is not the case with this car. There's plenty of boosty feel See if I can get it down to a second here. Okay, that's five. There the turbo comes on. And uh, it reminds me really of the good old days when the Saab 900 turbo first came out. Uh, it had the shortest first gear on record. Uh, the thing would uh, snap your head off for about zero to 30. Then you'd shift into second gear. Uh, it would fall into a well. Uh, had the biggest interval between first and second you could imagine. Then the turbo would hit in second. And then you'd be, you know, uh, back up against the windshield, and uh, you know it was um, it was lively. You know, the thing is that it was crude and uh, you know kind of unsophisticated, but you knew you were driving something. Uh, in this case, this car very much the same. Uh, it's a big party uh, at the throttle. Uh, the the steering is. Uh, super light and super assisted and kind of numb and it will also torque steer under power if you have any kind of steering angle in it like crazy. The clutch is uh, really light, really, really feathery and so it's, uh, it's, it takes a little while to engage it smoothly. So again, you know, you, uh, you know you're at the wheel. This car is a little spendy, uh, you know, if you really want the whole smash like this is, you know, it's 38 grand. Um, and uh, that's a lot for a little Volvo coupe, but you won't see yourself coming back and forth on the road every day. You know, you will not meet yourself uh, at every corner. This is a rare car, and uh, it's a cool car, and it's a car savvy buyer's choice. And uh, yeah, I like it a lot. A modern toaster can manage most of the tasks of a full-size oven and save on time, space, and energy bills. Test Kitchen chooses their winners based on a range of functions, including capacity, speed, safety, and overall pizzazz.
Thanks for watching Off Duty. I'm Kelsey Hubbard. Don't forget to click above to subscribe and stay tuned to WSJ's Off Duty YouTube channel for more video content. We'll see you next time.